If you knew that the longest living people in the world ate about a dozen foods pretty much every day, would you want to know what those foods were? And whether you go to Southeast Asia or you're going to Okinawa, Japan, it's Ikaria, Greece, or Sardinia in Italy, or if it's Loma Linda, California, there are certain trends you see all around the world regarding what people eat that is correlated with their unusual lifespan and in general, their quality of life and how healthy they are all of those years of their life. Now this video, I thought I would share some of those foods you see worldwide, as well as the profession that has studied longevity more than anyone else, traditional Chinese medicine. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Alex Hine, board licensed doctor of acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, and author of the health book, Master of the Day. So let's jump in. Now, before we jump into specific foods, we have to talk about the high level philosophy of the role that diet plays. And I want to talk about this concept of yin and yang, because you've probably heard this. And you know, when I was a little 14 year old punk, I wore this yin yang necklace because I thought I was so obsessed with Ninja Turtles and being a Kung Fu master, but I didn't know that yin yang are real clinically useful concepts. When I lived in China about 15 years ago, I was blown away by the food culture. And what I mean by that is when I would go and order something at a restaurant, first you have to yell, Fu Yuan, you yell, yell at the waiter and I would order and she or he would come over. We would order a couple dishes, like some pork dish, some dumplings, another meat dish. And she'd say, Hey, you have three hot dishes and no cooling dishes. And I said, what is this? What does that mean? Why is she suggesting cold or cooling dishes? And my friend was just saying, it's just for a balanced meal. And then, during the meal, we would have some, you know, juhua cha, some chrysanthemum tea. And I was thinking, there's like some food science behind this culture that's just built into the culture. She said, you know, you have three meat dishes, it's kind of heavy. You should have like three vegetable dishes. And meat in traditional Chinese medicine is warming. Vegetables are very cooling. So that balance is not only healthier, literally, to have some seaweed and have some cucumbers and have some vegetables with all the meat, but then you have poor tea which is a fermented tea that's basically like a digestif in Europe, but it's a fermented tea pressed into a cake that's amazing for digestion and bloating. And I thought, this is like a whole lesson on food science from one specific culture every single time I go to get a meal. High level medicine to me is before even what you eat, it is sort of the strategy, if you could call it that, regarding what you eat and how much you eat and what you put together. Now, when it comes to food, Digestive problems still are the number one problem I see in my clinic in Los Angeles. While there are many people who eat a terrible diet and of course they have digestive problems, there's an interesting population of people who eat pretty well and have lots of problems. And the reason is their nervous system is dysregulated from stress, from being type A, from their approach to life, from the pressure from, that they have going on in their lives. Now I'm actually doing a one-time live workshop in a few weeks called the five traditional Chinese medicine practices to reset your nervous system and your adrenals. It's a time limited. We're just doing it once. I do probably four per year live. I'll do a one hour workshop live and then a Q&A as long as you guys are there. If you're seeing this video and you followed me, come join me live. It's a limited number of seats because I pay for a software that limits the number of seats. We'll dive deep into the five daily practices you can do, the signs and symptoms of nervous system dysregulation or adrenal fatigue. And then we'll talk about the practices you can do. And then we'll have a live Q&A. It's the link right below this video is the link to enroll and register. You'll get a confirmation. Please join me if you would like to learn more about this. Now, if we jump into the science, what actual foods specifically can help? Because I know people don't want to be told to just eat less and exercise, right? There's got to be some little food I can put in my diet a little more and I'll be healthier. Well, I'll focus on four today. Number one is green tea. Our culture in America is not big on consuming green tea. Maybe matcha is more common. Still is basically the same thing, but you're consuming the leaf. But green tea, very commonly consumed in Asia, has a lot of benefits. So in terms of the actual benefits themselves, they are very high green teas in antioxidants. It helps reduce inflammation. It can support heart health and it might even lower the risk of certain cancers. Now, in terms of the benefit to your longevity, green tea, like in populations in Japan, like for example, Okinawa, known for longevity, they regularly are consuming green tea on a day-to-day -day basis. Number two is fish. So a lot of us in the US, we're not big in consuming fish. If we do, it is the most vanilla kind of fish like salmon, basically. But 
Lots of cold water fish have many, many benefits that you see in some of those coastal populations that you maybe don't see more inland. In terms of the benefits of fish, fish, especially the fatty fish, mackerel, sardines, and thankfully salmon, are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, which are great for heart health, and they also reduce inflammation. Now, what is the benefit to your longevity here? In terms of the link between these fish and longevity, again, if we look at like Okinawa in Japan, they have a very high fish consumption, which is thought to contribute to their longevity and lower incidence of heart disease. Now, heart disease is still in our top three killers, probably still number one in the United States. And again, moving towards a more pescatarian diet instead of hamburgers, red meat, steaks all the time has been shown to really reduce that risk. Number three is fermented foods. This depends on your culture and where you're raised. Maybe down south, you're used to eating a little bit of sauerkraut, or maybe if you're raised in a certain culture, or maybe if you're Korean, you're used to eating kimchi. But for a lot of different cultures, people are not used to fermented foods. In terms of the benefits and the kinds of fermented foods, miso, like in Japan, or natto, or kimchi, like I mentioned, or for example, sauerkraut in the US and in Europe, are fermented kinds of foods. These foods are rich in probiotics, which support gut health, they boost your immunity, and they can potentially reduce the risk of chronic diseases. We talked about digestion being a giant problem for people, focusing on getting probiotics and prebiotics from food, not from supplementing with a probiotic, can be really, really helpful for some people. Small amount. Now, the link to longevity is that, like in Korea and Japan, fermented foods are a staple, and the consumption of them is associated with longer lifespans and reduced risk of GI disease. So lots of us have digestive problems. Colon cancer is still a huge, one of the top five cancers in the United States. Consuming these foods can potentially lower the risk. Now the fourth food is something you can actually supplement with. It is more common to Southeast Asia and India, but that fourth food that we've talked about here is turmeric. Now, the benefits of turmeric, you know, there's an active compound called curcumin, and it has strong anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects. These are linked to reduced risks of chronic diseases like cancer, heart disease, and even Alzheimer's. Now, when we talk about the link to longevity, in countries like India, turmeric is a staple in curries and other dishes, and they potentially have lower incidences of age-related cognitive decline. So we're talking more about cognitive decline, right? Alzheimer's dementia here, which is pretty interesting. Now, besides the specific foods, let's talk about the high-level philosophy of eating one more time. Because if I asked you, what is the number one thing killing us today in America? Drum roll, please. It's food. So like when people come in and they ask me, oh, is coffee bad? Is sugar bad? The number one thing that kills people is food. So should we say, is food bad? <laughs> no, right? Depends on the quantity, the quality, where it's from, what it's sprayed with. And all of these things sort of are the high level strategy of eating. Now, I wanna talk about yin and yang again, because these are big concepts in traditional Chinese medicine. The first aspect of yin and yang is quantity of food. You know, there are super interesting studies showing that if you just eat less calories, even if it's <laughs> junk food or not good food, often your blood profiles will improve, which is sort of funny. But quantity is one of the biggest issues. And quantity is one of the number one issues correlated with like acid reflux and gallbladder issues that I see, as well as even IBS for some people. The second thing that we talk about is what we call the temperature of food. Sometimes people call it the energy of food, but the temperature is what that waiter, that Fu Yuan, was saying to me when she said, oh, you have three hot dishes, but you don't have any cooling dishes or cold dishes. This is sort of, in a way, aligned with like the acid alkaline theory. Meat, more acidic, coffee, more acidic, and vegetables and that kind of thing are more alkaline. In traditional Chinese medicine, they call them warming or cooling. And sometimes the foods that are warming can potentially generate inflammation, and sometimes the foods that are cooling can decrease inflammation. When you look at our culture, you look at heart disease and cancer and all of these illnesses that are so expected. A lot of it is excess calories and excess warming foods that promote inflammation. Warming foods, meaning like meat, fried food, excessively eating food generates inflammation and heat in the body as well. So a lot of these things fall into the category of too much yang. You know, for a lot of our culture, it is not enough whole grains, not enough vegetables, right? Not enough fruits. All of these are, the fruits and vegetables are very cooling and the fish are very cooling or less warming than actual like red meat, for example. Chinese medical theory has established for a long time that eating like a temperature neutral diet or slightly cooling diet tends to be better for a lot of people in terms of longevity. And sure enough, our culture with excess meats, excess sugars, 
excess pastries. All of this generates heat, inflammation, stagnation, and all the complications of diabetes and heart disease that come from that. Now I've put together entire videos on having a more cooling diet overall and what that actually entails. But in general, having a more temperature neutral the slightly cooling diet is what often promotes longevity. That means like, for example, having healthy whole grains or rice, having a cup or two of sauteed vegetables, and then a little bit of animal protein, minimizing alcohol and coffee consumption in excess, and trying to stay away from sugars and processed foods. At a high level, that is more of a balanced or slightly yin diet, as we would call it, that is more cooling in nature and will promote longevity. So that's what I have for you today, guys, on the diet that promotes longevity, some of the practices, philosophies, individual foods that will actually help you live a long life and a healthy life all of those years. Don't forget, I'm doing this live workshop on the five practices from TCM that can help you functionally reset your adrenals and nervous system. It's the first link below this video. And again, our spots are limited, but I would love to see you there. It's live and then we'll do a Q&A as long as I'm there and you're there, I will stay answering your questions. I may pour a glass of wine, but don't worry, I'll be there answering all your questions and it's gonna be really fun. So. Check it out and sign up. And don't forget, I have lots of other videos on dietary therapy and how it can heal from a TCM point of view right up here.